Good evening and welcome to um, our April 26, 2021 meeting. I apologize for us running a little late, um, but I call the meeting to order and I'd like to ask you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask for a moment of silence for the victims of the shooting that took place in West Hempstead last week. Thank you. And now I'll ask for our high school student government representative, Christian Lamont. Lamont here. All right, um, good evening. So again, for those of us who may not know me, my name is Christian Lamantia and I'm the PUB JFK student government representative to the Board of Education. Now into the fourth quarter, students are focusing on their studies more than ever to finish out this school year strong. With AP tests fast approaching, many teachers of AP classes have begun to offer review sessions virtually this year. And in, in an unexpected added benefit, many sessions are actually recorded live, allowing students to, to view the sessions on demand and as many times as they want. With AP tests varying in format and location this year, students are thankful to review with their teachers in any way that they can. This past week, students and families were surprised with, the, with an announcement from the JFK Building Administration. In a video message released in an email blast, students were happy to learn that our prom was moved to Leonard's Palazzo in Great Neck and our graduation will be held at the Hofstra University Stadium. We greatly appreciate all of the work that our administration and senior student government board has, has put into making prom and graduation as memorable as possible this year. Also in celebration of the class of 2021, the PTA has organized discounts and deals for seniors at local favorites like Catch the Wave, Duchess Cookies, Family Bagels, Wong's Noodle Town, and more. All students have to do is present their student ID badges to the cashiers and enjoy. The POB JFK Drama Cadets hosted their first ever Broadway trivia night with ticket sales benefiting, benefiting Broadway Cares. The night was full of fun with three trivia rounds and a Q&A with Broadway star Danny Quadrino from hit musicals Wicked, Newsies, and Bye Bye Birdie. Pobots is currently holding a fundraiser for the Nassau Suffolk Autism Society of America, and for a donation of at least $1, Pobots members will create a heart with your name to be displayed in the main lobby. To donate, students can scan the QR code on the flyers around the school. Other events include the Chinese Honor Society's Bingo Night, Drama Club's Magnet Fundraiser, Advocacy Club's Holocaust Remembrance Event, and Community Service Club's ShopRite Fundraiser. Looking to the future, Senior Decision Day, Science Honor Society Induction, High School Night of Scenes, and Student Government Elections are coming up soon. That's all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we're going to go to our middle school student government representative from Matlin Middle School, Zayed Kazai. Hi, everyone, and good evening. My name is Yad Kazi, and I'm the school president of Matlin Middle School. Dr. Colorado has been meeting with eighth graders regarding the end of year activities, including graduation and an end of year celebration. Matlin students and staff participated in the second shine a light on your day by wearing their favorite motivational quote. Our first Relay for Life walkathon will be taking place at Matlin Middle School during the week of May 17th. The students at Matlin Middle School are gonna walk relay style during their physical education periods around the track the PE teachers created to try and help raise money for the American Cancer Society. Eighth graders participated in their first HS 101 and mentor program with the peer mentors from the high school. Madeline Student Connects had another meet facilitated by our eighth grade president. Back seventh grade students will be particip participating in a virtual online hunger simulation to increase awareness of food insecurity. Fifth and sixth graders are happy to return to the cafeteria for lunch. Thank you. Very much. And now board announcements. Susan.
I don't think you might. You might see. So I just want to give a little shout out to Healy Middle School. Uh, thanks them for sharing their sunflower classes. I started the uh, seedlings and they popped and I've been able to distribute them among the board a little bit. So they are going places. So thank you for your sunflowers and please hopefully sharing pictures shortly. Thank you. Any other board announcements? Okay, Dr. O'Meara, superintendent announcements. and thank you for joining us. I just have a quick announcement. You know, um, so much of our guidance has changed with relation to reopening schools, but more importantly, about moving up ceremonies, graduation and prom. So thank you for all of the students who have advocated for their events to happen as traditionally as possible. And you see that the high school is able to, with a last minute change in regulations, accommodate a prom for our seniors um, at Leonard's and um, a graduation that has the entire class together. Now, I know that brings up a lot of questions for our fourth grade parents and our eighth grade parents. The difficulty with planning an event that requires, if there are over 100 participants testing COVID um, vaccines and or uh, 90 days of have had, in, have had in COVID, that's what didn't come out correctly. Um, it takes a good while to plan that. Um, please don't, think that planning is not going on. I know our fourth grade principals, our elementary principals sent out to parents today, just an early commitment. Were you planning to attend in person, knowing the regulations? And once they have that information, they can begin what type of event they can host and what technicalities have to be put together that include uploading data of people's current vaccination status, COVID cases, and testing and testing not only the PCR for 72 hour notification before the event, but also for those wishing to do a quick test and that would have a rapid test that would have to be done within six hours. That, that really involves a good deal of planning, location changes, et cetera. So please be patient, they are planning, but again, the initial data they need upfront is how many parents would potentially come or family members to an event if it were to be in person and knowing the regulations of testing that come with that. So. That's all I have on that. We have a pretty loaded um, report. So I'll move on to that if you don't mind, Mrs. Bergson. I'll do the grading policy first. So Mr. Donnarumma, thank you. If you could just show the slide. Um, I mentioned this briefly at our last board meeting. We have um, concrete information from the state. We don't think anything else is changing in relation to that. And our department chair people have done a lot of thinking on this, talk to their teachers. And some teachers, thank you, have spoken with their students. So here's where we're at with our recommendation that we move um, the regents to remain 11% of the final average for the students who take that regents exam and it helps the students grade. In cases where it does not help the students grade, the student could ask for that score to be redacted from his or her transcript and an E put in its place, meaning exemption. And the students can do that as long as they've successfully passed the course. That would cause each marking period to be raised to 25%. Because if you recall, we did not hold a midterm this year and we had redistributed those five points, percentage points over the three more, four marking periods to make them 22.25% each. So if a student takes a Regents exam and he or she is not happy with his grade or his grade does not help his overall average at the current 11%, they would redact that and the four marking periods would be worth 25%. Now we also have other courses that typically ended in a regents, but the state is not offering regents such as chemistry, physics, geometry, advanced algebra, um, algebra two. So in those courses, um, they will offer a final assessment that will be part of the fourth quarter grade. That would be offered during the final exam week. There would be one hour exams. Students who have um, time and a half or double time, the most they would be there for would be two hours. That test score would be included in the fourth quarter average and each marking period would be worth 25%. And lastly, we had courses that ended in final exams that were also 11% and those would be courses like Global Nine. Those courses would have a final assessment. Again, it would be counted in the fourth quarter as a fourth quarter assessment. It would be given during that final exam week, but it would not have any additional weight outside of that marking period resulting in four marking periods weighted at 25%. So
So we really took the no harm um, policy from the regents and extended it across all of our courses that typically ended in a regents not being offered and or a course that ended in a final exam. My only caution is to those students who are teetering in the 63 to 66 range. Um, when you opt not to take a regents exam, please make sure you do the correct calculation of that 25%. Know really where you stand in the fourth marking period. And we do encourage students to take the regents that are being offered. The teachers have worked very hard with you. The curriculum has been taught and assessed throughout the year, and they say it will be completed before the regents exam. And since it's a no harm, it's a wonderful opportunity to sit for a regents, see what you needed to do to prepare for that regents, and how you fared on that regents before deciding ahead of time not to take it. I say that with the caveat of, I don't know how you are mentally or emotionally right now. And if assessments tend to cause such great anxiety that it outweighs the benefit of finding out how you would have done on a region so you get to discard, should you not be happy with the grade, then that's a decision for your family to make. But it really is a true no harm this year. So that's what we're recommending. Um, and the board, if um, you have any questions, but if not, we, you have that later on to act on as a revision. Questions? Lauren, I, I just want to make it um, or reiterate, I think I had asked it once before, but that there is no um, makeup for this year's regents, right? So Excellent. Yep. it's like a one and done. It's a one and done. So if you miss the regents exam, um, there isn't an August regents. And if you pass the course, you would be awarded the E. That course will still count toward regents diploma. It has no impact on advanced regents standings as those regents are not being offered. Um, and, um, you know, students are choosing to take it or not. And if you're sick that day, then, then you've chosen not to take yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. Any other questions? Okay, later on under new business, we are asked to approve um, the recommendation for the, the change to the grading policy for this year. Um, and with that said, we go to reopening. Great, thank you. So, Mrs. Anarumo, thank you. You'll share the presentation. So, you know, um, on April 9th, about five o'clock, the state released more guidance on reopening. That was very interesting for us because um, immediately we had a few emails thinking you can reduce to three feet now, so let's bring all the students back. And this reopening guidance had a lot of requirements around it. And I know we've been compared to other districts who have brought students back earlier. If they brought their students back earlier and decided to go below six feet, prior to these regulations, you know, that's part of what their reopening plan had. But right now we're not in that. We do need to go through what the state has required of us. Should we make any decisions in any of the areas that are on your screen right now? The new regulations addressed social, uh, physical distancing between students, um, the removal of physical barriers and an emphasis on increasing ventilation and circulation and filtration the monitoring of community transmission levels when making decisions to change your reopening plan, the necessity to gather community input before making any changes. And lastly, if you are in a high risk zone and you are going under the six feet to implement a COVID, tested, a COVID testing process. So um, it's important for the community to know that we started that right away. We had those regulations on Friday night and Thursday we held a town hall. We had about 200 people in attendance there. And I know other people are watching tonight, but it's important if you didn't watch the town hall and aren't very familiar, um, this is an important part of the presentation that you understand our regulations. There are not um, any exceptions for adults with the six foot rule. So in a school building, teachers still must maintain six foot distance from students and each other during activities that require projecting the voice. So our music now has gone down from 12 foot to six foot, but the six foot, we couldn't do three feet in a chorus room or in a band room. Common spaces, such as the cafeteria, if they're eating, they must be six feet apart. We also have in phys ed classes as well. So we need to hold meetings, which we had last Thursday night, our town hall, and we're having a reopening committee meeting on Thursday to discuss these further. Thank you, Mr. Donnarumma. The community transmission rates are good news for us right now. They are going down pretty significantly. You've seen from the regular correspondence going home that we've had zero or one case, not many. We're not seeing many quarantines associated with those cases. Again, at the secondary level, that's a result of the six foot distance. You can see that Nassau County 
hit on April 24th, the first time below two. Um, and the seven day rolling average is a little bit above two. So we'll keep a close eye on that, we're aware, but that's important. We need to make sure the community knows what our transmission rate is. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. Despite all that, the quarantine rules remain the same. If you are within six foot of somebody who has COVID, whether both or none were wearing a mask, you are considered a close contact if you've been within that distance for more than 15 minutes. So when we're talking about a classroom situation right now, students who are within six feet of another student that tests positive would be quarantined for the 10 days, unless they are fully vaccinated, asymptomatic, or they themselves have had COVID in the last 90 days. This is an important um, picture to understand what that means. We've done all the math. Um, we have really wore out our custodians and our principals a little bit, but we've asked them to do this in all their classes. What does three feet look like? How many desks can you get in there? What does four feet look like? And how many desks? And what does five feet look like? In seven to 12, we already know what six foot looks like because that's what we currently have. If we go to three feet and one student in the class tests positive, 12 students get quarantined. In a seven to 12 schedule that we have that don't have students cohorted, that one positive student period one could quarantine 12 children. When that student moves to period two, it could be another 12 students. So over the course of a day, the potential of quarantining 96 students for one case is a possibility. Does that seem extreme? Absolutely. Is this a scare tactic? It is not. It is true. If we move to three feet and someone's positive, that is the collateral damage of that decision. At four feet, it gets reduced greatly. Eight students. But again, over an eight period or a nine period day, you're looking about 64 students potentially. And five feet gives you four students side to side, front and back. And that's less significant. So that's important that everybody understands those risks. On the survey that we'll discuss in a couple of more slides, most parents were in favor of bringing more students back who responded to the survey, but the question started to change when we, we talked about this reality. Then people weren't as certain because with Regents exams and AP exams and some of the other activities students want to participate in, the risk of it becoming a close contact is a scary proposition. Thank you, Mr. Donnarumma. So here's some of the community feedback. Normally you see pie charts for me, but I, I didn't wanna do that this time because there's a lot of mixed data in some of the responses, particularly remote students who answered questions about alternative day, remote students that said, or their parents said, if you went five days, the children would come back. So we teased all that data out much more carefully than we did the student data. So as you can see in each grade level, we have more students or more parents saying they would like their children to come back and still a healthy group that said, I would want my child to remain as is in the hybrid. It's important to note that nearly all of our special education students are back every day or have been invited back every day. And that's about 14% of our population. 20% of our secondary students are on remote already. And then we have some students, we are operation bring the right students back, which really identified other students who might really be struggling and need to be in school every day they've been invited back and have started to return. So right now, these are the last group that are back. Mr. Donnerman, could you go back to the parent survey? One slide back. Thank you. Um, so with the stark differences, daily instruction 687 said they would come back for five days and 290 would prefer to stay in the hybrid schedule the every other day. Now, if you look at the high school numbers, 131, 124, 112, that's the parents' response. When you go to the students' responses, which didn't surprise me as a mother of five teenagers, well, actually, some are in their 20s now, but I still have two teens at home. Can you go to the students now, Mr. Donnarumma? The students are saying, not so fast, mom and dad. I am very comfortable in my every other day schedule. So you see that the numbers aren't as far apart on the student survey. And this is pretty much in line with some of the comments we received from both sides of that daily or hybrid pro or against coming back full time. And we can go to some of the comments, Mr. Donnarumma. So um, I collected, there weren't a lot of comments, but the comments that were there had a theme and the ones that are in the darker peach, those are the comments from parents and students that are more in favor of bringing students back every day. The ones in the light beige are the ones that really are fine with the way it is and don't wanna see any changes for the remainder of this school year. And they range from, 
I don't do well on remote instruction. I'm better when I'm in front of the teacher to I'm used to this. Don't change now. There's been enough changes. Parents who are like, I think it's time to bring everyone back. The numbers are showing there's not that much risk to parents saying there's too much of a risk. If one student gets tested positive, others are impacted, even though they haven't done anything. So, you know, those are some of the comments I'm sure you've seen on Facebook pages, among your friends and family members, and probably in your own household. I've not been shy about, I have a 12th grader and a 10th grader. The option was offered in my district. My 12th grader stayed full remote. And my 10th grader couldn't wait, back to get, wait to get back to school. So I understand both sides of that and the reasons for it, and you know your children best. Um, next one, Mr. Donnelly. That's what we have. Right? Yeah, that's what we have. So. You know, I bring this to the board's attention. So I know you're aware of all the work we've been doing and I really appreciate you sticking with us to the bitter end of this unusual school year where you've probably just put in more hours as board members on every issue. Um, but we're at a point where we're hearing from some parents that are very upset we haven't brought students back and I, we're going to need some direction. Are we going to remain in our current model through the end of the year or is there some other options we can explore to bring some of these other students back? to everyday instruction. Okay, thank you. Um, do we wanna go around and opine on the presentation and what we're thinking? Gary, you wanna begin? Uh, I'm, very ex <clears throat> I'm very happy to see that we're looking at bringing more students back as soon as possible. I think we have to do it in an orderly transition, not just open a floodgate. And I'm sure that's what we're talking about. Whatever we come up with, you'll come up with a solution to bring us to that point gradually, not all at once. But I, I think the guidance and people getting vaccinated is starting to have an impact on our society and things, it, things can open up a little bit. I'll be honest, I've been going to Islander games. You know, we, I had to get a vaccine. I've been tested more than I can imagine six times right but yes I, I i'm all in favor of bringing the kids back i understand that i might be a little of an outlier and that i'm comfortable with the four and a half feet which limits it to the exposure being to four students not the diagonal students it's smaller but it's not the same as it is but i understand that pe people in the community and on the board will feel that that's you know maybe too close for comfort so to speak but I'm happy that we're looking at doing this. And my understanding is from a date point of view, we would like to begin bringing kids back when? I think any changes do require some work. Um, we probably having a meeting today with our head custodians and our building principals and our director of facilities and Mr. Cunningham and Donna Rumo, we could see some movement as early as May 10th. Um, oh. And I guess it's important to say we're committed to bringing everyone back in September, right? Like we, we are absolutely working yes. for that. It's just right now we have new guidance and we have to engage with the community. So mm -hmm. do we move on that new guidance or do we wait and just do everything in September? Well, like I said, I might be a little more aggressive on this one, but I'm, I want them back and I can, I'm okay with it being closer, but I understand not everyone's going to feel that way. Tara? So I don't, I don't have children yet at seven through 12. Um, so I'm listening to what others are saying, to trying to take in what I've heard from community members. Um, and I can only rely on the experience I've had, but it's a little bit different. Um, if, and family members who are, are seven through 12 kids. I think it would be great to get them back. Um, I'd like to do it in a safe way, fill it out, um, make sure everyone's prepared <laughs> as much as possible, um, and that we can handle it. If you know, we presented on the different situations that could result in quarantine. Um, I think it could have an impact on some of the people who are currently wanting to be back. But if we change it to three feet, that might change their mind. And the potential impact and exposure that can have, especially when we're talking about the APs and the regions coming up um, and kids finishing up you know, their, their senior year. So I think that something to talk about in terms of the, the distance and what options we have 
educationally and, and spatially that could work um, and make sure that our kids continue to get a sound education um, either way. So I would be for bringing them back, but maybe not at four feet. Ginger? Thank you, Tara. Yeah, I'd like to see the kids come back. I think it's about time. Uh, I think that for social and emotional reasons, they belong with their peers. They should have the opportunity, at least for those children who have missed the gap years, somebody from fourth grade who stayed out, missing the fifth grade and going right into the sixth grade, that's an enormous transition. But if they have a period of time, at least of a month to get used to the building, the same for our eighth graders who would be 10th graders, we have to have the kids get back to having a system to their lives. I think that that's something that's missing the ability to communicate with each other. It's not all about academics, but it's about transitioning a way of life to a new way of life again. Something that was so routine, the first day of whatever you start school, this is what you do. I definitely wanna say September has to be a normal school year in my mind. I would like to see us do it as soon as possible. I think our staff needs time to know when kids are gonna come back and what kind of clusters and everything else. So, because they will have to change their classrooms also. But I think for children who have been remote and if their parents want them to say it, they have to let us know. So we have to plan also because every inch is very important to us. Right now I'm at the six feet. I feel very safe with that number. And if we look at the 20% that hasn't been in the high school and then you're gonna have the kids uh, the seniors being moved out of the buildings anyway. We're going to have more space in those classrooms also. So yeah, I'm all set to say it's about time. Thank you, Ginger. Lauren? So um, our reopening plan was a robust reopening plan for our district, I'm proud to say. Um, we moved slowly um, as the state continued to make adjustments. We made adjustments. Um, we brought back our most vulnerable population five days a week, sports, real graduation, prom. Um, so little by little, we've done things. Um, we know students are not getting the social emotional interactions with their peers and teachers. And that does concern me. Um, I also know our teachers have been working harder than ever. They've risen to every occasion, whatever's been asked of them. I'm proud of them. I'm proud of our students who are more resilient than we've given them credit for. Students have had the need to be back five days a week. And for those, for those families that really have been, that have been had the need to get back five days a week, those families have been contacted. But I have a bunch of questions because as a board, we've, or as a board member, for me, um, safety has always been first and foremost in my mind with this whole, crisis that we've all been going through. And number one is who would come back and who would we choose first? Would we pilot a certain amount of students to make sure that we do things correctly because we haven't rushed through any of this and we've done it well, such as a cafeteria type situation. Do we have enough room in our high school cafeteria? Because we haven't in the past when things were good. Um, we want to make this flawless if it is come September. Is our buildings prepared? Seating, plexiglass, air purification, so is everything in place? Will physical education look like physical education and will everybody be able to participate? If a student is quarantined, how will they make up APs, finals, when they have to prep for SATs and ACTs? This not only affects a student, it affects parents' financial situations too and their college futures. Um, will lockers be used? We haven't had the use of lockers. Will in-person remedial be allowed to be used? Um, clubs, are they fully going back? Little things that we haven't touched upon and now we're thinking of opening up a larger situation. Again, I'm all about safety first. I know and I want so badly for our students to be back. I have two. I have one in the middle school. I want have one in the high school. And yes, students perform better in school, but I just want them to be safe. I want all our students to be safe first. 
and I just want to do it right. So I just have a bunch of questions that I would just love to have answered before I make my vote. Thank you, Ms. Daxteen. And we do have a, re um, a reopening committee meeting on Thursday. So some of the questions such as, do we prioritize a certain group over another group? Kind of similar to your pilot question. Lockers we wouldn't use this year. No, there's certain easy answers. I mean, I can give you those, but I think um, the bigger question you have is related to safety. We wouldn't bring all back. Who would we choose? How would we prioritize? And that would be a conversation I'd like to have with our reopening committee who helped make those decisions about the other movements we've made. We said we would prioritize our special ed population, and we did. We said we would prioritize our ENL population. We did at risk, social, emotional. So that really has been our guiding um, for our marching orders. And they've really um, done a, a lot to make sure the right kids have been asked back. And now it's this last group. So there's that. So that meeting's Thursday. I can get you some more information about that then. Great. Thank you. Susan? Thank you. So as a mom, um, I've seen this not now as a secondary parent, but I do see it in my family. Um, I have one in college and college has definitely been trans transformed. There was a New York Times article um, regarding the feeling of what most of us are going through. It's called languishing. Languishing is the state of being stagnant with almost no hope and for the most part, a lot of us, not just students, not just teachers, but the communities have been languishing. Well, how do we, how do we fight languishing? Well, you have to start with enacting change and that change needs to be flourishing. Um, we need to start creating routine. We need to start bringing people uh, together, giving them those opportunities to connect. Now the science is showing us that the viruses are low, the vaccines are working, the spread is coming, uh, the spread is not happening as quickly. Uh, more and more people have the opportunity to get vaccinated. Um, a quarter, maybe 30% of our students might even have that opportunity if they choose to do so. Uh, we have shown that our plans have been safe with the, with our, opening our schools and having K through six in every day. And for those reasons, and primarily for those reasons that I think we all need to start flourishing again, I definitely would like to see us open as quickly as possible. Um, I understand the need for time and planning, but I would like to make it the shortest time. I wouldn't like to draw this out too long. I, because there are only X amount of days left in the school. I actually am very comfortable with even the four, four and a half feet, um, if that's, but as soon as we can get this going and if the, everybody else on the board is in agreement, I would like to see this happen. Um, I promise not to disappoint you all and to be long-winded, though I will, um, in my thoughts. Um, approximately two weeks ago, the Department of Health issued its new guidelines that reduced social distancing to a minimum of three feet under certain circumstances. Those guidelines, however, maintain six feet for the purposes of contact tracing and by extension, exposure and quarantining as the superintendent demonstrated tonight, as well as during the town hall. That means that the exposure from almost no students goes up to 96 students for every one positive case, and somewhere in between. Since that town hall meeting, we conducted a survey whose results have now been presented. And what those survey results tell us is as important as what they don't. What they tell us is that if we reduce distancing in grades seven through 12 classes, about two out of three parents would be willing to send their kids back to school five days. A week. Doesn't tell us how many demand it or prefer it or need it or simply want it. Rather, they'd be willing to do so. Similarly, the survey tells us that one out of three parents would not be willing to send their kids back to school five days per week 
and would instead like to maintain the current hybrid option or the remote option, or would pull their kids out of the hybrid option to go remote if we went five days. In both instances, the reasons behind the choices aren't entirely clear. Student survey presents a completely different picture as to what their wants are. Students overwhelmingly, in comparison, I guess, chose the opposite of their parents, a majority preferring at this point not to return to five days. So where does it leave us? What do we do? Because survey results, while helpful, aren't and shouldn't be the end all be all of a district's or board's decision-making process. Many of us have received emails, calls, text messages. We've been approached in person from parents and students giving varying views as to how they want the remaining eight weeks of this school year to proceed. Some say my kid is struggling academically, socially, emotionally, while others say my kid is doing fine, but I just need them out of the house. Some say, why now? There are just eight weeks left. We have a routine, a system, no reason to upset it now. Some are concerned about exposure before camp or graduation or prom. Some are concerned about exposure before regents exams and finals. Some say their kids doing better academically, social and emotionally under the hybrid model. In fact, one parent even told me, I want kids back full time now, but I want you to roll it back to the hybrid model in June. So there's no exposure before camp and finals. Of course, what's right for some parents, some families and some students may not be right for others. So I appreciate all the feedback from parents and students sharing their views, what's best for them as they should. As a district and a board, we have to consider all of those viewpoints and perspectives. While parents and students may vary in their view of what to do in the remainder of this school year, one thing everyone seems to agree on is there is an overwhelming desire to ensure we have everyone back full-time this fall. That is something I support. It appears my entire colleagues support. Um, and it is where our efforts should be focused ensuring that we could safely open fully five days a week this fall. And regardless of what we decide to do for the rest of this year, this board is or should be committed to that. And I know that we are. As for this school year, with eight weeks to go, with six weeks before regents and finals and less time perhaps before AP exams, I see more downside than upside in substantively changing our plan. Our focus should be identifying the students who have needs and continue to bring them back. But with, a few, with so few weeks remaining, changing the status quo of the reopening plan for this year to say all open for everyone without any limits, to me, seems short-sighted. If, however, we are able to accommodate additional students without increasing the current exposure of students, let's explore that. Parents committed to what works best for them under our reopening plan for this year. And while we've made tweaks and enhancements over the year, as we promised we would do, substantively, we've maintained the same structure, the same structure. It makes little sense to me to just rip the Band-Aid off, bring everyone back now, bring an entire grade back now, if doing so will increase the exposure for those that don't want it, for those that committed to a hybrid model for exactly what the hybrid model um, was set to be. Here are the three arguments that I've been presented the most with. One, we have regions coming. We need to get more in-person instruction for those kids taking those exams. With greater exposure, there's a greater risk that students will be quarantined. So if you get quarantined within 10 days of that regents, you won't have the opportunity to take it. There's no makeup exam. And in fact, there are students who will go remote 10 days before those exams to ensure that they aren't quarantined, defeating the goal of creating more in-person instruction time as there will be less in-person in instruction time for those students. What about the tutors, the Regents Review courses? The district isn't going to reimburse for those costs if your student can't take it. What a waste it would be if exposure disallowed a student to take the one shot that they have at. So in my mind, bringing kids in a classroom who may force others out because of that increased risk of exposure 
isn't the right approach. The second argument, the generic, students need this, even for just a few weeks. To that I say, as I've said before, as I think this board has said, and the district has started to do, let's bring those students back. The students that need it. Let's identify who needs it academically, social, emotionally. Let's bring those kids back now. Doing so would not create a situation where we would have to modify our reopening plan substantively with just weeks to go in the school year. It shouldn't upset the current uh, distancing guidelines that we have worked, that have worked all year in, a limited, in limiting or eliminating exposure. And therefore, there is or would be very little, if any, increased exposure in the school. But it would provide those in need greater instruction and greater school social contact opportunities. In my mind, we don't need to bring back everyone at every grade or even in full grade. We don't need to do that this year. And there are kids who are also prospering because of the high risk. In my view, six to eight weeks remaining, there should be a high burden to overcome in order to subsequently change our reopening. Finally, third, it's been pointed out that surrounding districts have brought students back full time. But as we know, just because they have done something doesn't mean that we can or should do the same. We provided, as Lauren eloquently described, a pretty robust educational program this year, more robust than most districts K through 12 with electives and other opportunities. Far from perfect, far from what we had pre-COVID, but pretty robust. Every district is faced with weighing all of the factors, classroom spaces, number of remote students, community positive rates, among other things. There's no cookie cutter approach here. And just because another district does something that type of peer pressure, if you will, is something that should not guide this board or this district in doing what we believe is right by our students and our community at this moment. You know, until recently, meaning the last week or two, our community's positive rates were above those that existed last year in May, June, July, August, September, October, and at least some of November. And this is so despite the high number of people who have been vaccinated and the high number who have tested positive and presumably have antibodies. I am thrilled that our rates have dropped significantly. I hope that continues and I hope that's a harbinger of things to come. So perhaps there is less of a risk. But remember part of our success, seven through 12, the reason we have had so very little exposure in our buildings is precisely because of our protocols now, the plan as it now exists, the hybrid model and desk six feet apart. Why change that? I believe it is unfair and wrong to those families who have chosen the hybrid model based upon that representation to now be forced to have to either go remote or expose themselves or their students in order to accommodate the wants of others. But, if there's a way that we could accommodate bringing those kids back without, while also maintaining the same low level of exposure, I could see that as an option. If there's a way to bring back more students and not increase the risk, let's explore that. To me, there, is, there are some ideas out there, including some neighboring districts that have explored, as I understand it, the idea of a spillover room. Other districts are doing or shifting certain classes to other bigger locations, bigger rooms. That to me is intriguing. It's intriguing because that might be the right middle ground, but we have to see if we can do it. Where there's a classroom that can accommodate additional students and still maintain the six feet, we bring those students back in. They're in the actual classroom. Where they can't, they're in a spillover room or the whole classroom goes into a bigger space. Well, in part, it operates similar to at home by signing on through Google Meet. You have students in the building every day. You address those attendance issues. You address some social and emotional issues. 
you have more eyes and ears on them. If there are eight periods, it may be that some may be in class, others in the spillover room, but that still improves and gets kids back to wanting. I get that there is a willingness of parents and some students to return full-time this year. But to me, there doesn't seem to be a groundswell of support for pushing that at the risk of pushing others out or at the risk of increasing the exposure. To me, let's explore that middle ground, the best of both worlds, the one that strikes the right balance this year. Identifying 200, 300 students out of 2,300 who may want something in and of itself, to me, that isn't the kind of overwhelming push to completely upend our plan six to eight weeks. And I too am a parent of a secondary student. And I've spoken with and I've been accessible to many parents, and many students, seven through 12, and even including the last two weeks, I've just had a few come and approach me and advocate for full time this year as a need and a few as a want. Most say, I'll do it, I'll take it, but your focus should be make sure we're back next year. We know that 10 who speak are often louder than the thousand who say nothing. As a board, it's our job to figure out and determine if the 10 that are speaking reflect the will of the thousand who say nothing. And we've said this time and time again, there is no playbook for COVID-19 at schools. We're all doing this for the first time. We do the best we can with the information we have. And the information we have is that our hybrid model has worked. It has kept our students safe. And for those that it isn't, bring them back. We've identified, we've already have, let's continue to do that. Bring those who need it. And if we're bringing cat back more kids that we've taken care of those in need, then what's left are the wants. And I'm not willing to upend the entire reopening plan with weeks remaining this school year and displace other students simply to accommodate those wants. But I am in favor of accommodating the wants if doing so doesn't raise the exposure risk this year. Because pulling a kid out to remote 10 days before Regents, 10 days before finals, 10 days before camp and graduation or whatever it may be, because of increased exposure now, defeats the whole purpose of the reopening. I love the idea of something in between if that's workable. I want to reiterate our goal is and should be and will continue to be ensuring that we're fully open September. And I am confident that we will be able to do so. As to this year, I would only support a modification to the change if doing so maintains whatever the risk is now, that low risk, maintains the six feet, explores other ways to bring more people back, but still keep the exposure at the low risk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, I go. Um, I've done nothing in the past week but think about this issue. And um, I want to reiterate what many board members said. We really want to emphasize and let there be no doubt that both the board and central administration is committed to bringing back all of our students for full-time in-person instruction in September. Our budget was built with that assumption. And unless something changes, some mandate changes, um, the risk to COVID returns, we are committed to bringing back all students in September. With that being said, I've believed, well, always, but certainly um, through our discussions this year, that full-time instruction benefits students the most academically, socially, emotionally, as long as it's done safely, which we have done. But what's changed now? Um, I believe that most adults, or at least many adults, in our district are vaccinated. Many parents in our community are vaccinated. Many of our 16 through 18 year old students, juniors and seniors are vaccinated. And the infection rate in New York State, Long Island, Nassau and POB is much lower now. I've always felt that we need to look at the risks and the benefits. I felt all along that the risk of exposure outweighed the benefit of having kids 
in person five days a week. Now I believe with many people vaccinated, positivity rates greatly reduced, um, new guidance from the CDC and the DOH, the benefits of full-time instruction, physically being in the building, not in their pajamas in bed, and the positivity rates being greatly reduced outweigh the risks, especially with, as what Seth spoke about, an overflow room. I would prefer to keep the six foot distance because I would like not to see um, more exposure, um, particularly at this time of year where then students would have, to, more students would have to be quarantined. Um, I, I, and I truly believe that even with only six weeks left, kids need to feel that hope, that structure, that socialization that full-time in-person brings. Additionally, it, will, it could help inform how we go about creating the summer programs that we discussed during budget um, to meet academic needs, social and emotional needs of our kids. It may also give us some insight into what curriculum needs to be written over the summer for the fall and next school year. I also believe that for many students and perhaps staff as well, it, coming in now, even with the six weeks left, could um, make it easier to go back in September as opposed to worrying all summer about what it's going to be like and kids going into a different school that they've never been in. So I think it could help with those things as well. Um, again, for me, it's always been about risk versus benefit. And now I believe the risk to the kids, especially if we keep it six feet, the six feet distance, um, that that outweighs the risk to students' academic, social, and emotional needs by being out of school. Um, and, you know, one thing that you spoke about, Seth, about student, you know, bringing back more students that could be identified as having a higher risk. I've spoken to a number of parents, and this makes sense to me even without speaking to them. Kid, many kids don't want to be identified as being a high-risk student, whether academically, emotionally, and socially. So they're not going to allow their parents to call their guidance counselor or the principal or whomever because they don't want to be identified. Whereas if everybody's going back or most or the people who want to go back are going back, they won't feel that they are being identified as something other than what everybody wants to be. So with that, um, why don't we begin with a show of hands for who wants to bring more students back? We'll, we'll discuss the, or not discuss, we will also weigh in on um, the distance that we're comfortable with, if in fact the majority of people want to bring more, more students back. So can I see a show of hands as to who wants to bring more students back? This year, we're only talking about this year. Everybody's coming back next year. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Debbie, can I ask? I know that we're going to be talking about distance and how we do it. You know, I think that qualification matters. So if it's just the generic who wants to bring more students back, we've already done that. And I, I mean, I know that, like, I certainly will raise my hand. I want to bring more back. But if bringing more back results in. Okay, so you want to go amount, to I the think, second question yeah, first. Okay. What we've heard from everyone is that we're willing to bring more. It's just how many more and how. Okay. Um, wait, say that again. So you can only weigh in if you have the answers to the questions you asked. Is that what you're? Well, I think what Seth is trying to say is we want to know how many students we would bring back. 
and when, and I don't think we have the answer to those questions. Am I correct in saying that, Mary? We're waiting for guidance, but I think the question is, is any, irrespective of the parameters, is there a desire to even explore bringing all students back there this year? Okay, so based upon that, is there a desire to bring all students back next year? I mean, that's a different question than- I Well, I, I, guess, I guess that gets us to the 10,000 view, and then it's okay. the next, then like, now, where are we going to start seeing where we have to start consensus building? Like, if everyone wants to bring everyone back and you see the value in that, then is there a way we can make that happen that's in a comfort zone with the majority of the board? Okay, so <laughs> the 10,000. 10, Gary's at 10,000. Um, a show of hands of all those who want to bring all the students back. Was that the question? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, so it is five yes to no. Um, Seth and Lauren. Um, and it's important to know we have 20% of students on remote. They've made it pretty clear unless in the next two days, those parents, two days will know any remote that wish to return. This is the last opportunity, but we're not seeing any um, big movement there. We're pretty comfortable. The 20% remote right now will remain through the end of the year with their last chance to opt back in um, notification on the 29th. Okay, so Susan. So Mary, what you're saying is, if we put translate that into numbers, so 80% of the students in the high school would be able to come back hybrid wise, right? Yes, we have 2,300 students, seven to 12, and we have 20% on remote. So that's only 460 students. So you're still looking at 1,800 students to come back. Okay, right and now, our average class would, that, let's say an the average class year. would be? But what did you just say? An average class? 28, pick a number. If the middle schools, our average class size are about 22. And at the high school, they range and they could go up as high as 28. Okay, so but 20, so but 80% of 28 would be, you know, I have sure, to, we have yeah. that data. 22. <laughs> I guess, I guess if you're really, if the biggest question is, do the benefits of bringing everyone outweigh the risk of being um, a close contact and quarantined and not being able to complete the school year or coming back for a day and then being quarantined and out for 10 days, you know, that's the risk. The only way to mitigate that risk is by maintaining the six foot distance. So maybe that's another question. Can we bring back more students and maintain six foot? And what other districts have done who haven't gone below six have a spillover room. You know, I know there are certain districts that if they can't fit a period two global class, all 28 in, because all 28 decided to come back, they split the class. And if you can only fit 17 comfortably and keeping six feet distance, 11 go to a library or an auditorium and they engage in synchronous instruction but maybe their next period is um, English and they have 17 seats and only 17 came back so they can fully be in person. And a lot of districts are operating that way that we're unable to um, bring more students back and maintain a certain distance. I know COMAC, they went down to four and a half feet but they still needed spillover rooms because they have larger classes. And there would um, be developed a method of who's going to be in the spillover room on even days or odd days yeah. or however it's done, but it wouldn't be the same children. All no, the time. it wouldn't be. And you could have either something on the six day schedule, the six day or by AKLZ. And then there's also, if there isn't a lot of those and we can move a classroom to accommodate say an algebra class, I have that in my mind. I know there's one algebra class in um, POBMS and I know there is an English class at Matlin that have 26 kids and only one remote student. We can't get 25 in. Certain classrooms we could get 26 in, like a tech room is a little bit larger. We could look at some of those machinations too, but I guess the guiding principle is we can't keep telling everybody, can you do three feet, four feet, five feet? If the board tonight says, we're really stuck on the six right now, then give those marching orders and we can begin that work and work with our committee on Thursday to say, here are our marching orders, who are we prioritizing? And what does that timeline look like? I look at that and say, by May 10th, the following week, we could bring our first round of that back if you give the trust to the, 
not the trust, but the decision making to the committee, as long as you maintain six and identify the appropriate students and prioritize like you've done, then bring those back May 10th and we come back to the May 10th meeting saying, this is how many. And then maybe that's when you have a sense of where the community is balancing out with this, because to Seth's point, there were a lot of people that said they'd bring them back, but then there were some irregularities in, well, I want everyone back, but now that you're talking about 32 kids, and if that's my child, does that outweigh the 10 days? So do we start there with the six and like we've done all along, a slow, but then it's measured and it's manageable. Right. Gary and yeah. Tara. I just want to clarify some vocabulary so that people don't get <laughs> something wrong. When we say everybody, we don't mean everybody. No, no. The remote, the people who've opted to be remote will get to stay remote and that will still be an option for people to do. So we're, we have three levels of instruction. We have every day in K through six. We have every other day, the alternating days in seven through 12, and we have remote. We're not looking to affect the remote program. We're not looking to affect the elementary schools. We're looking to, the discussion is, can we take seven to 12 from rotating days to every day? And can we do it with a six foot radius to keep everyone comfortable by using hybrid and better use, not hybrid, by using overflow rooms and perhaps better use of the physical plant to put bigger, some bigger classes may switch with some smaller classes to get it done. Yeah, and, and there's also another factor that starting May 18th, when some of our high school students begin their virtual AP exams, and you know your seniors, June 11th really will be their last day in the building, we'll have a natural thinning out anyway. So if you are calculating that with a slow on-ramp of other students coming back, you're also lowering the risk because you would never be at full capacity at any time. Tara? So um, to what you guys were, were kind of just saying there, I would, I personally would prefer not to go below six feet. Um, I don't love the idea of having kids remote in because they're there. I think it could create some other issues. Um, if we can figure out a way to equitably address that, um, who, who deciding, you know, who's in, who's out when in a way that is predictable so that these kids aren't now all flustered. Um, if any of the overflow room usage could be used in an edu, you know, make sure it's being used in an educationally sound way that makes sense so that kids aren't being distracted um, by other kids. And then I, I think a lot of it goes to the usage of our property, of, of their building and anything, other options we might have. And to the extent that we can have some of these core regions and AP type classes and or any of the, the classes where kids hands-on in the classroom is really important. To the extent we could move those to a bigger space and switch out, you know, location, I think that's something that we should try and put a priority on. Um, but I would like to stay within the six feet. Susan and then Lauren. Mary, if more kids are in the school, would there be an option for prescriptive remedial in high school? Sure, but it would be, it's currently remedial. I mean, sorry, it's virtual. So they would just be in another part of the building and remedial in. Uh, but also we would, would we have the option to be in person then? Would we be, would we be able to do a person? I don't see a problem with that, but I do, currently don't know enough about the high school schedule where those teachers are on their remedial. They might be in small spaces to make room for all the additional sections we've had to create. But so they might be doing that from a small office, their okay. remedial. All right, but, um, but more importantly, they would be in the same building. So if they had to touch, reach out to, and professionals would be able to reach out to the student because we would have them physically in our buildings. Mm -hmm. That's one of the advantages of bringing students back, yeah. Okay, thank you. Lauren? If this were to occur and we had overflow room, who would be in charge of the supervision and how many supervisors would we need? We would have to have a ratio, what would be, make sense, but we have the staff to do that with okay. our aides, with our teachers on, we could have assignments, we have COVID subs, we okay. shouldn't call them that, we have one year subs, it's a terrible thing. I just wanted to make sure we had enough supervision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ginger? Um, I'm very comfortable with the six feet. 
I think that that's an important distance. I'd also like to say that some of our cases of COVID have come from students who are on remote, that there have been parties, there have been sleepovers, there have been kids who go to different activities, and that parents should, especially if they're letting their kids come back to school, be cognizant of that also. I think that to me, it's we're all about health and safety, and that's physical and mental also. Mm -hmm. And a lot of articles and all the papers all over about suicidal ideation from kids who are just, they're just closed in a house. We don't know what goes on in a lot of people's homes. Not every home is a sanctuary for children. School becomes that sanctuary for many of our kids. And I feel that there's an obligation for us to protect children. And again, I'm just gonna say, I'm very comfortable with starting to bring back our children. Uh, I don't want this to go to June though. I'd like to see it by the end of May. So at least they get 17 days of school, maybe the feel, the sense of what a school is like, and it will help them get over their jitters for September. Beth? Yeah, I, look, I, I think Ginger's right about pointing out the fact that most of the exposures and the risk that's happened seven through 12 is outside of the school, right? So, but we can't control it. What we can control is what happens in the school, which is why changing the model to increase that risk is what I'm against for this school year, right? But what I'm now hearing my colleagues say in support in general is that they're open to maintaining the six feet as well. And if there's a way to do that in that spillover way, that bringing more students back, still giving those, you know, accommodating those that want to come back and not upending the plan. That seems again to be what the middle ground. Mm -hmm. The other thing I, I want to point to, and you know, is is the idea of the, the easing back for students. I, I, Debbie, I, I think you're right to say that there are students who um, don't want their parents to uh, to highlight them or, or bring them out. I, I, you said it more eloquently than I could. I doubt that. Um, but, you know, two things to that. One is, as I'm hearing my, co my colleagues say is, well, you're the parent, right? And clearly the parents are saying one thing, the students are saying the other. And the second thing is, I think we sometimes don't give kids the credit um, that they deserve in terms of them being more adaptable, them being more flexible, them bouncing back. Um, more um, than we think that they will. You know, to me, I don't, exceptions to the rule perhaps, but the easing in of coming back, I mean, many of these students will, will go to camps, they'll do some summer programs, they'll take, they'll go out on vacations with groups, they'll do things. So, so I don't envision that being, that easing part being an issue, but I'd love to accommodate more students, right? And I'd love to, to not accommodate them at the risk of, having those who, be, who where it's less choose to now go out, right? Mm -hmm. the, the whole idea is, is helping them by increasing that exposure. They're gonna, they're gonna opt to go remote before finals, before regents. And that's the opposite of what the goal is. And, and I think we all share, like, we want to go back to normal, like whatever that is these days, right? Like we wanna go back to what it was. Um, we're only talking about the next eight weeks, right? We're all committed to going back full time in September, safely going back, as long as we're legally allowed to go and back. Who knows, every guidance comes out every other week. So, <laughs> but I, you know, let's explore that. If we can accommodate the six feet, I know there's some on the board that are in favor of going less, but if, if there's a majority that's on the board to maintain it, I, I'd love to explore that and give that charge to the reopening committee, that charge to the superintendent to keep that, keep the exposure the same. Okay, I think what we're all hearing is that um, we would like to explore bringing more students back, but at the six foot um, spacing, so as not to increase the 
um, possible exposure and then um, the more students and staff who would be quarantined. Is that correct? And so what, um, if you don't mind, just for clarification, so when we go to our reopening committee, those would be the parameters and then we would prioritize. So during the week of May 3rd, if we could start some of that. So by the time we come back May 10th, we should say we're at full capacity. This is the amount of people at this point we can now handle with those parameters and then see where the community's at. Are you hearing like that's been enough? And then we'll be down to six weeks left to school. But I, I think that will be a healthy enough signal um, a return. Those who really are in need will come back. Um, they won't feel ostracized because once we tell parents this is what it would look like and there is this spillover possibility, I don't know if everyone will think that's ideal and they right. may opt to. But at that point, parents will need to commit one way or the and other. And that would be the only thing. So then parents would have to commit because even though we have the option in our reopening plan to go remote at any time, we can't have back and forth after May 3rd. Once you're out, you're out till the end of the year. And once you're in, the expectation is every day, not I have a dentist appointment and then today's the day I'm just going to sink in from my dentist appointment. It's right, you know, they'd have right. to, they're taking up a seat for somebody then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Lauren and then Gary. Oh, Tara. I'm assuming that we would get requests for students to want to, who are come, if, if this comes to fruition, who want to stay out due to regions concerns or AP concerns, would that be allowed? Well, our plan allows that, Lauren, but then there's no time to return. So think of the regions. Those are, if you go remote then, you'd be remote anyway, regions is during, right, but the two weeks the air, before, right. if you go remote, you'd be on remote instruction. AP students. Yeah, that's always an option to do, but you couldn't come back then. Like an AP student who's taking an exam, say, on May 18th, and they just want to quarantine two weeks before, if they're six feet apart, they wouldn't get caught up in a quarantine situation. It would be what they did outside of school. You know, they're not going to have, unless they did a carpool or sat within six feet with somebody on the bus, you know? Yeah, sure. Tara? Um, so I, I guess I have two questions. My first question had was about, you said either you're remote or you're back every day. If you choose to come back every day, we're going to make a schedule for you and we're going to make a lot of reconfigurations to make it possible for you to come back. You can't decide I'm back Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 65 degrees, beautiful outside. And I really just wanted to sleep till 725 instead of getting on the 650 bus. We can't have that. And I have to tell you our teachers and thank you for recognizing the work of the teacher, Ms. Saxton, because they're really that's hard. That's hard to manage when you make a lesson plan for a certain group of students. And then one social studies teacher told me on Friday, I was supposed to have eight kids in person. Two showed up. And they can't deny them access to the Google Meet because they don't find out if that's an excused absence till later in the day or even Monday. And they're trying to do the right thing by all the students, but there have been abuses and it's not right for the teachers. So we would want a firm commitment from parents that we, there's no risk as far as quarantine, but you're committing to five days. It can't be it has to be a firm five days then. I can understand logistically that it could be difficult and it could be somewhat of a nightmare if you've got, unless you have a, something figured out, you've got kids coming in and out all the time. So um, but like playing your hands I just want to be clear, you're saying that, are you saying there's these two options? It's either you're all in or you're all out? No, no. If you choose to come back five days, you have to come back five days. Okay. And then um, my other question was, to the extent there are seniors taking APs, I guess what you were saying is if they want to go remote during the APs, then they have to stay remote for the rest of the year. And that would be 10 through year. 12. We have 10th graders through 12th grade <laughs> taking AP exams, and those occur beginning in early May in person. Some of them are in person, mm -hmm. but the bulk of the um, virtual AP exams that would, the students would be taking at home begin May 18th yeah. and run through June 11th. I totally understand. I just wanted yeah. to, those are, a couple of questions I could see a couple of groups yeah. wanting to know information on. So you could have a student that goes remote that's five days or hybrid. They have to they're gonna they're gonna get the same teachers that they have now. 
Yeah, in the seven to 12 model, they stay synchronous then. And then in terms of the time frame, I know that you earlier mentioned May 10th, and now you're saying something about the weekend plan, May 3rd. No, that's what, what I'm asking. If we talk to our committee and they are able to prioritize a certain group and we could move, do you want us to start moving before May 10th or you want to wait till May 10th to say, we've identified this is how many? Well, let me ask from a practical standpoint, the reopening committee isn't convening until Thursday. Right. Then we'd have to ask parents. Yep, and we'd have to get desks, and we have to so it's schedule. pretty much and, not uh, going to be before. Well, but, right. but the question is, if we can do that all during the week and invite students back for May tenth, that's before we meet again. Right, May tenth is the day we meet. Or is but it May eleventh? You know, I know that seems so technical, but it really is important because they said they can get a certain amount done in in that time by May tenth. But does that mean? Listen, if we give the guarantee, it's six feet. I don't. You know, you know, that's what I want you to say. If we aren't changing the risk, then people shouldn't want, shouldn't have feel the need to go remote. Um, and if they were, they were going to do it anyway. <laughs> no, I, right? right? No, I hear you. I'm, I'm talking about practically in terms of the time frame of, you know, if, if they're not meeting until Thursday. You need a commitment from parents on the five days. Practically, you're not getting them back uh, two days later. No, like, right. But so we, it, it requires like a letter home, a asking, schedule change. But if asking, we do that week till the tenth for permission, then it, we're we're kicking that down till almost the end of that week. Then you understand? If I come to you and say we've identified in each grade level eighty students, parents have said, "Are you okay with that?" Then then it's the sending the letters Tuesday the eleventh right. and I'm not just, really in terms getting of the back expectations about. Sure, yeah. We put out there different time frames mm -hmm. for different reasons that is that changes based upon different variables and certain <laughs> Every variables. Time, yeah. Not through any fault of anybody, but just that, that changes. So just to put it out there, there shouldn't be an expectation to have any expansion, you know, Before. in a week. Or so. No, that wouldn't so be I, I, because I know you threw out the May 3rd, and I just want to clarify what that means. No, meaning once the um committee decides on a priority and we start identifying kids on May 3rd, that planning really will begin in earnest. Then throughout that week, ultimately ending in a letter home, your child has been, you know, we're able to make it work for your child and they could start May 10th. Or would you like us to come back and say, this is how many we were able to do it on, on May, 10th, May 10th and then send the letters May 11th. The earliest they could come back then is 13th, yeah. 14th, and then it's really like another week, not, then you're really back to like right. the May 18th, you know. Gary? If someone mentioned the word, so I'll just, busing, so I'll just ask, can we maintain the safe distancing on the busing to get all the kids back logistically? I guess that goes to yeah. Mr. Donnarumma, but I just want to make sure that we haven't overlooked a potential trap here. Yeah, I could comment on that. So, uh, so different situations when you talk about high school versus middle school, my answer in the end is going to be yes, we've accommodated. We can bring these children back. But for our seventh and eighth grade routes, you got to remember they're split routes already. So we're at a reduced capacity. Very confident. Every kid that's routed to those buses can step on those buses tomorrow. And I don't exceed the comfort level. The high school is a little bit different of a story because we only have one arrival, and one dismissal. With that being said, though, we've taken attendance over the course of the school year, especially specifically as this conversation has continued. Our ridership is only at a 45% level on our buses. So when you factor in how many kids are routed, ridership, siblings, and remote, there's about four routes that I'm going to put a close lens on, but I'm confident we can bring our kids back even at the high school level. Thank you. Okay, so I think, oh, Tara? So what we're looking at, I just want to make sure I'm envisioning this right. Assuming that we go through this plan, we can identify certain students for coming back from either remote or hybrid to full-time five days in person. Um, potentially being in a spillover remotely, but in that potentially. Then we also have kids going hybrid. Will they be remaining hybrid? Yeah. Because and we can't, that don't want to come back right now. And, and then you've got fit. the remote kids. The remote kids have one more opportunity to come back and they have to notify the school by April 29th. So in a couple of days, we'll know for certain 
of the 20% that are currently on remote, is that still 20%? Does it drop to 18? We're not seeing big movement now in kids coming back from remote at this juncture. We didn't see big movement back on the last date, April 15th, was it? We didn't see a lot of students come back remote then. Our remote students are comfortable in the program. Okay. Yeah. I know I'm, I'm beating a dead horse and forgive me for all you mounted unit police officers for saying beating <laughs> a dead horse. Um, I, I just want to clarify, if, sure. you're, if you've been all remote, if you have a certain set of teachers, if you're not remote, if you're in the hybrid model now and you go remote, whether it's- You're going to keep your teachers. You're keeping the teachers you yep. have. Mm -hmm. No matter what, you're keeping Correct. the teachers you have. Yep. Just want to make it clear. And that's happened throughout the year. We, if right. you recall, we opened so at like 16%. you go 10 days before reading. You're just Zooming into your Google meeting into your current class schedule. If you were like there your Monday, Wednesday, day. normally, yep. it's yep. going to be like Tuesday, Thursday, every day. Correct. Yep. Okay. Just want to Yeah. No, and I understand because in the elementary, we have a different setup. Well, that, that's why I'm, um, no, you know, I want to make People sure just want to clap. Clarification. Yep. Thank you. Um. Dr. O'Meara, is what you are asking, are we, if, if you go back to your reopening committee and then begin doing work, as you want to know, are we good with as long as you keep the six foot distance, um, even though we don't meet until Monday night, but you're ready to begin some students coming back the day of May 10th, uh, right, May 10th, are we okay with it? Is right. that what yeah. you're asking? Okay. Lauren? Just because we're so focused on the distance as we should be, could we just talk a little bit about the cafeteria? Since there's no masks in the cafeteria because they're, eat, they're eating, um, and how we visit, especially the high school where we have an issue there on a, on a normal non-COVID day, do we, you know, do certain students maybe go are assigned to a different room? Do they? I know some students don't take lunch, or how are we working that out? Yeah, that would be part of the conversation, Ms. Saxton. So that's part of can we fit even with spillover rooms? Because a spillover room would take another location. Does that still leave enough room? Um, and do you have to set up more desks in the library right now for students to be eating in the library? So there would have to be a consideration. That's all part of the room utilization work we've been doing. And um, if we can't do it, we can't do it. And when we are reopening committee meets, and I know one of the conversations with um, a group of teachers on Friday was, what group should you prioritize? And I know there's been a lot, bring all the seniors back. This is their last time. But some are concerned about the ninth and 10th graders taking their first regents exams. Like, let's prioritize them. And we have to look at all those factors of what we can actually do and what makes the most sense and who are the most parents? We saw even in the, the study, you know, the survey, the senior class, parents and students were the least amount saying, I want to come back five days, even though we've heard something different all year, right? So maybe they just need something else, some other activity to satisfy that, where the highest number of parents was the ninth grade parents. Um, that says something, you know. What? Go ahead, Susan. If we go ahead with this, and it sounds we are like minded in a lot of this. What about the clubs? The clubs have been back in person. The only ones that haven't been brought back are the ones that are too large for one space, like our National Honor Society, our yeah. student governments. They've brought their exec boards back for in person, but they um, have met virtually and other clubs. And we asked them this early on when the board said, Can you start bringing some of those things back? They went back to their clubs and some of the students found because of the alternating day schedule, they can get everyone joining if it's remote. If not, you have only the LZ kids in the art club can be in person because the meeting fell on a Thursday. Whereas, so they found, and there's only, honestly, Susan, Mr. Dewart, there's only two months left of clubs, maybe one more meeting, you know, May. Right. What, but, uh, and marching band's over. And marching band was back. Over. They were on the football field doing the last, Okay. game playing and they're they are so excited because all the musical groups now are reduced to six feet Yay. so acapella is back now i know um mr oliver if you're watching he was practicing Yay. on the stage so you know they took full advantage of that and the pta's been back you know they've started to put in their use facilities and starting to want 
to do some more things for the students. Okay, so on the outside. we're getting we we are opening for yeah. other things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just have one other question that somebody asked me today, and I know we've explored at times the use of tents. Is that something that we might look at in terms of either? the overflow space or a larger space when now we're into pretty much um, the warmer weather so we don't have to be nervous that it would be too cool. Sure, I'm gonna leave that to Mr. Cunningham if you don't mind to answer because he explored that a lot when we were opening back in September. The use of tents for any additional space. Sure, um, so there are districts that did um, use tents. They found that they could not use them year round uh, at least in their, their form. They do need to get approved as a temporary structure from SED, so we can't just go out and get one. Um, and that goes for anything that is basically larger than a car. You know, you can get one of those carports at uh, Costco that's 10 by 40. If it's larger than that, you have to get a building per permit for it. a temporary building permit. It has to have exit signs, et cetera. So we are investigating something that, um, you know, options that perhaps we could use year round. Um, Unfortunately, they still have to have fire egress. Um, we'd have to figure out how to heat it, um, which has been problematic and get the permitting process. Um, and that then also- But I'm talking about just for right now. So we wouldn't need heat, we wouldn't need, you know. So at, if we, just doing the, the simple math, um, at one of those, you know, we're trying to separate students by, um, six feet. So just one of those simple structures, um, we could only get about six to eight students underneath that, that simple structure. We would have to have a farm of them. Um, so we, we didn't really see that as an option and they also don't have any sides. So that then limits them on, on other days and they really have to be weighed down. Um, and then the question is, where do we put them? That's uh, another thing because they can't block the egress from the building. So right. um, we do have our architects involved in this and they have been involved with uh, uh, getting tents in other uh, school districts um, and can talk to us about their experience with that as well. Okay, thank you. And the SAC scene, or, uh, Susan, um, this is so great. Our administrators are really involved. They're all watching and I'm getting lots of texts. So thank you all. But Diana Beltrani wanted you to know the clubs have been gradually coming back in person and acapella booked rooms today. So, yay. That's great. So, <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Beltrani. Dr. O'Meara, do you have the information yes. you need to take back to the committee and to begin the work you need to begin? Yes. And if any committee members are watching, don't quit yet. We will get through <laughs> this. Yes, I, I think we have um, a good amount of information to start with. And... You know, and, and thank you for the parents who have um, been communicating with us that they see a need and we're going to be responding to it like we've done all year. Fluidity, you. remember Point that of word? clarification, the May 10th date is if everything is the way it's supposed to be, it would be a go? Sure, I, I'm feeling like right now we have the go. We just have to maintain all of that and we could start inviting students back. But again, we do need time to get that done. Absolutely, you know? right. And desks are an issue. We've moved all our desks to the cafeteria. So any additional desk we need to put back in a classroom, we have to find a replacement in the cafeteria. So it takes just, a little time. Just a thought, could we put tables and chairs, rent tables and chairs that kids could eat outdoors? Yeah, that, that's, that's you know, we can't build a plan that's weather dependent because you could have three days of pouring mm -hmm. rain and that's the problem. Good umbrellas. Part of the thing with the tent, you know? Okay. Okay. We're all as good as we're going to be right now. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Seth. Completely unrelated. I know I wasn't here um, at last week's uh, board meeting when the final budget modifications were made and the uh, board voted to adopt it to put it out to the community for a vote. I just wanna say great job by the board. Um, I support the modifications that were made. And, um, you know, I think uh, that we continue through our common sense budgeting to manage to maintain and expand upon programs and services. So, um, you know, if I were here, I would be a yes vote. I would have been a yes vote, but I just want to publicly put it out there that I support the modifications that were made and um, the budget that's put out there. So, um, great job. And, uh, 
Make sure everyone please go out and vote. Thank you. Can I have one more thing for that? Sure. Because you know, it, since we're off the topic now, we want to talk about anything else. Right. There's been a lot in the newspaper and a lot of um, senators, particularly, um, we have seen a lot of Mr. Todd Kaminsky talking about what other districts should be doing with all the extra funds that districts have been receiving. And we will mention this in our budget workshops that will begin tomorrow. But it's really important for the community to understand this windfall of money people talk about in the press is not in one place that is related to our general budget. So Mr. Cunningham did a fine job of explaining our improved revenue picture, but I'd like him to just to speak for just a couple of minutes about what we really received in foundation aid, and then what is part of the federal stimulus money that lives as a grant that has very strict rules around it, some of them not even published yet, that are part of like our summer school planning and programs and things that we need to put in place to make sure everyone can come back next year. So Mr. Cunningham, would you just talk about how that extra 1.9 million in our foundation aid helped us improve from our original superintendent's proposed budget to where we landed last week? Sure, um, and we are very appreciative of the work of our elected representatives up in Albany in developing this year's state aid package. For Plainview Old Bethpage, that $1.9 million in foundation aid is the really big news. It's a 17% boost in foundation aid. Um, for the board members who were on the board at the time, the foundation aid formula went into effect during the 0708 school year. And since that time, Plainview Old Bethpage has never gotten its full allocation of foundation aid. And while we're ecstatic to receive the 17% increase next year, it's important to know that we're still projected to, to receive almost $5.5 million less than the full phase in amount, All right? So we, we have never gotten the full allocation of foundation aid Certainly, this is a great step in the right direction. Um, we're hopeful that Albany is able to keep its promise of a full phase in of foundation aid by the 23-24 school year. A full phase in of the foundation aid formula would be such relief for our taxpayers. and would also help us fund exciting programs and initiatives. But time will tell if the state will be able to raise the revenue enough to do so. And I'm sure this is gonna be a focus of our conversation next January, 2022, when the next version of the executive budget proposal is released. Um, regarding this year's boost in foundation aid, it enabled the Board of Education to reduce the tax levy by about $600,000 less than what was originally proposed in February, right? So that's a really significant change. And as we discussed often during the COVID this COVID impacted year, we had to make some very difficult decisions to forego certain projects in order to afford the cost of COVID. And we've, we've uh, had several presentations and discussions on this. The district spent about $4.8 million in unanticipated pandemic related costs that were not aided by the state or federal government. It just came out of our local funds. And the financial impact is, is that we're still projecting to end the fiscal year with less than 4% fund balance. We spent fund balance to sustain our operations this fiscal year. So while the boost in foundation aid helped the board adopt the tax levy that was significantly less than what was originally proposed in February, the foundation aid alone was not sufficient to compensate for the cost of deferred replacements, identified educational needs, and the operational deficits caused by pandemic-related costs. Um, just um, skipping down a little bit more, uh, Dr. O'Mara referenced um, some federal funds, and we're reading about these in Newsday, and uh, Newsday didn't call us for an interview, uh, but if they did, we would have had something to add. Uh, we've started our planning process for the use of the funds that will come directly to us from the federal government. Um, for example, today we did have an internal meeting regarding the use of the American Rescue Plan funds and the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supp Supplemental Appropriations Act, respectively referred to as ARP and CRESA. Uh, but the formal guidance has not yet been issued, but we have a good idea of what the guidelines are going to be. And you may have noticed in today's Newsday, school district administrations have been active in their initial planning for the use of the funds that we must exhaust by September, 2024. It seems far away, um, but that's gonna come up quick. So we're hoping to see the guidance on the use of these funds released by the state education department in the near future, hopefully this week. Um, and once we have this guidance, we expect we will be putting together a task force that will include teachers, administrators, and stakeholder representatives to develop and submit a plan for their use. 
We already know that these funds can be used for COVID related costs, programs that address learning loss, enrichment programs, indoor air quality projects, et cetera. As we develop our plan, we must remember that these are federal dollars, right? And they're going to be gone by September, 2024. So another part of that conversation is going to be, how do we sustain programs that we might start so they just don't end when the federal dollars go away? Um, with that, are there any questions? No, thank you. Okay, now we're going to move on to public participation. District policy number 1230 provides that persons wishing to make comments or raise questions shall one state their name and address and two indicate on whose behalf they are speaking if a non-resident. The policy prohibits public discussion on matters relating to staff and students at which their reputation, privacy, or rights to due process or those of others could in some way be violated. As a reminder, a video recording of this meeting, including public participation, is being made and will be posted on the district's website. Remarks are limited to three minutes. We thank you in advance for being respectful of other speakers, the Board of Education, and all staff members. The floor is now open. Um, well, I think I see one speaker. Of course. You could take it off. I don't think you're near anybody. On. Not offering. Jody, hold on. Jody, hold on. I barely even needed it. You heard me, right? Let no, me start Jody, again. You know what it is? People at home don't. So can you start over? Yes. You need to be on. The can microphone. I? Can I? Can you reset the clock for me? Because I have a lot of to say. Of course. Okay. The clock. Okay. Please. So exactly. here we go. <laughs> Sixty-one. That's the number of Long Island school districts that have already brought back grades seven through twelve for five days of in-person instruction, and that list gets longer every week. By the end of the year, it is a very real possibility that we may be one of only a handful of districts on Long Island not offering full-time in-person instruction at the secondary level. I agree that it was reasonably cautious to not want to be the first or the 10th or even the 20th out of the gate. It made sense to let other districts try it out so we could learn from their successes and their mistakes. But 61, that's a number we should be comfortable with. Some of those districts are larger than ours, and they have opened with minimal, if any, major problems. So many of these kids have checked out. They're disengaged, they're lethargic, they're unmotivated. Some of them are anxious and depressed. Many feel isolated. Many are falling behind academically. Cheating was so rampant at the high school that Mr. Murray had to take action, which included making the students sign a pledge. So I would argue that no, not everybody is doing very well. And I know that there's a process for bringing back the students who are in most need, but I ask you, what eighth, ninth, or 10th grader wants to draw attention to the fact that they're struggling academically or emotionally by being one of only a few kids who's allowed to go to school every day? It's like wearing a target on your back. It's time. Remote options should continue for families who have medical issues or who are not comfortable, but these kids need to get back now and you've got 61 other districts that you can go to for advice. And I just, you know, I know as a former board member myself that you guys sometimes have the opportunity to sit with groups of stakeholders within the staff and the faculty. I encourage you to sit with the school psychologist and ask them three questions. Number one, how many more kids are you seeing in school than you would in a normal year? Number two, how many more kids are you referring to outside therapy than you would in a normal year? And number three, how long are the wait lists at those therapists? Because some of them have wait lists of four to six weeks from what I'm hearing. So many kids are struggling here. It's time. Let people stay hybrid if they want. Let people stay remote if they want. But the kids who need to go back, and it's, I, it's more than you think it is, get them back in the buildings. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any Ask the Superintendent questions? We have one. In light of the Suffolk County decision to join Nassau County and not mandating testing for high-risk athletes, 
due to low positivity rate and increased vaccinations, will the school district be reviewing their requirement to test boy lacrosse players two times a week? The NCAA considers boys lacrosse a moderate risk sport similar to soccer, and the NFHA's F F F F H S Sports Medicine Advisory Committee has removed the risk categories altogether. That's it. Okay. Um, seeing no other speakers and receiving no other questions from Ask the Superintendent, public participation is now closed. May I have a motion for routine business? Ginger, second, Lauren. Any holds, separation, or discussion? All those in favor? That was unanimous. Thank you. Ms. Bernstein? May I? This is Dr. Molieri. Hello? Ms. Bernstein, it's Dr. Molieri. May I speak? Hi, of course. All right, by, by action of the Board of Education this evening, you appointed four new teachers. Would you like to know who they are? We sure would. <laughs> I know you know who they are already, but by, uh, by your actions tonight, we appointed Ms. Daniela Rawlings as a special education teacher at POB Middle School. We also, at POB Middle School in the English department, appointed Ms. Colleen Cho. Um, two, we appointed two health and PE teachers uh, tonight, Mr. Alec Abramowitz and Ms. Michelle uh, Barkley. Ms. Barkley may be in the audience out there still. I'm not sure if she stayed. She uh, is. That, okay, <laughs> excellent. So she is there. So I want to welcome all four of them into, uh, into our family and wish them well in their endeavors as a uh, full-time teacher in the Plainville Beth Page community. Thank you, Dr. Molieri. And we welcome you and um, the other three staff members who joined our family. And um, thank you for choosing us. Okay, now we're going to go on to new business. What? I'll say kudos for sticking around. <laughs> <laughs> that gets a bonus. <laughs> Can, can, you just saw Rich fall off his chair. Um, can I, um, on 11.1, .1, may I have a motion on the approval of the amendment to the grading policy for the 2020-2021 school year? Tara second Seth. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. May I have a motion for the approval of the consent to joint representation letter and approval of engagement letter? Um, Gary, second Seth, discussion? All those in favor? Thank you, that was unanimous. Um, May I have a motion on 11.3 adoption of the Board of Education meetings for the 2021-2022 school year? Ginger, second, Susan, discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Is that part of discussion? <laughs> yes. 11.4. Um, can I have a motion for the approval to reject the original bid 395 and approval to rebid bid 395R, generator project at Pasadena, Judy Jacobs Parkway and Old Beth Page Elementary School. Gary, second, Tara, discussion. All those in favor? Seth? Um, I'd like to make I'd like to make a motion to amend the agenda to add an additional new business item, item number eleven point five, a resolution providing as follows: the Board of Education approves the stipulation of settlement for the employee reference and confidential schedule A, and authorizes the president of the Board of Education to sign same. Second, Lauren. All those in favor. That was unanimous. May uh, I? I oh, can make a motion right. to adopt or pass the resolution, the newly added <laughs> new business item 11.5. Thank you. Lauren, all those in favor? 
Thank you. Can I have a motion to enter into executive session for the purpose of obtaining legal advice from district council? Tara, second Susan, all those in favor? Thank you all very much and drive home safely. Thank you.